Hello, hello, everyone. I am so excited to introduce you to the most incredible woman. Her name's Aslan Berry, and she is from emotionalarchitecture.us. And I was so impressed with her article, I absolutely had to do a video follow up with her. Hey, hi, everybody. <laughs> yes, and thank you so much for sharing your Sunday afternoon with me. I appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I don't do this lightly. Sunday is my fun day, it's when I go out and play. <laughs> 24 hours. <laughs> We're going to make it fun. We're going to make it really fun. So you and I both have a history of being chronic people pleasers. Yeah. And that usually comes from childhood. Share with me where your interest in people pleasing really started. For me, I didn't get interested until I was in my late teens. I wasn't even consciously aware. Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, I'm internally a little nervous. <laughs> oh, don't be nervous. Don't. I promise I'm not. I'm not scary at all. So I'll, I'll um, you know, start on my story a little bit. I didn't know that I was a people pleaser until I was about 19 years old. And I was confronted with a situation where I was up late at night and I love my sleep. I, sleep is my number one favorite thing. And I was working on something I couldn't hate more for someone I didn't even like. And I was like, huh, I have a problem. So that's my little story. I don't know if you have an origin story like that. It's so typical. It's so typical. Um, damn. <laughs> I love it. That like perspective, like literally having the internal perspective of, of just, I don't feel good while I'm doing this is so important yeah. for someone who's a people pleaser because it's not something we have such a high tolerance for things that make us feel bad trying to like, keep the peace. So for me, my people pleasing behaviors really came from a necessity of keeping the peace. Um, mm. It had like everyone that has these tendencies that comes from different places. Um, hey, uh, we're going to get real personal real fast. Okay. Um, people pleasing wasn't a topic in my mind until maybe the last couple of years, but I feel like over the last couple of years, it's become more popular. It's become like an archetype, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not clinically. I don't believe it's clinically a thing. There are aspects and different disorders that have people pleasing as something that is characterized or like a common thing. Um, but just over the last couple of years, it's really kind of like grown into something that people are realizing that there is a stream of issues with this. For me personally, my people pleasing behaviors came from my own trauma or abuse that I experienced. So for me, people pleasing was very much a necessity to feel safe. Mm -hmm. I'm dancing a little lightly because it's I don't want to like necessarily, I want to be able to help people who but not trigger everyone. Correct, <laughs> correct, yes. Here's the most horrific story that you're going to hear this week. <laughs> don't right, we this. don't want to do that. And I think <laughs> to your point about it starting to show up as a theme, social media mm -hmm. has, social media can be good or bad, right? And essentially it's a neutral tool. But one thing it has done is bring awareness to more niche topics like people pleasing, like chronic burnout, things of that nature. How do you think social media is contributing to the overall awareness of people pleasing and what do you wish it addressed that maybe it doesn't right now i feel like social media has the ability to catch in on any vein that you're putting even the smallest focus on mm -hmm. um it has the power and the strength to take you places that you're not prepared to to go which makes it a little bit dangerous in my mind um but at the same time, it may help give you a next level of awareness that you needed to kind of be pushed down that hallway in order to understand it. Like if you're if you're researching people pleasing and you're on the algorithms for TikTok or for Instagram, you are going to run into things that may trigger you. And that, that emotional trigger, that emotional elevation might actually be pointing you towards something that can help you along your journey. Mm. So you would say triggering is not always negative? Not always, unless you spend all your time there. <laughs> so how, what is a healthy way to deal with that? Like, let's say, for example, 
I'm triggered by a post about relationship people pleasing. And that I I struggle to, to grapple with that. Is this me struggling through some of the memories and the emotions? What's a healthy way to deal with being triggered? And I know that's going to be a little subjective for everyone. Yeah. I mean, an emotional trigger is something that is just giving you information. It's showing you something that's alive in yourself that you have an opportunity to begin to address. To me, I see negative emotions literally as an information system. It's a uh, way station, right? It, mm -hmm. And I see that, you, you know what I'm talking about? When you have like <laughs> semi trucks, you're driving down the freeway and there's a way station where the trucks have to yes. go off and really like weigh themselves. This is a negative emotion to me. Negative emotion is something that is calling you to step aside and take, take kind of a, a measurement or a weight on your soul. How do I want to act? How do I want to react? And who do I want to be? So anytime you get severely triggered, it is showing you something that is alive in you, something that needs to be addressed. So it's always good not to the best that you can. It's to not overtly react, but to step aside and kind of check in on, the, on those things. What, is, what do I feel? Why am I feeling this? Is there something that I can do about this right now? And from there, literally choose who you want to be. Who do you want to be and how do you want to react in that situation? Is this a friend or a foe? Is this someone in front of me that, that like, you know what I mean? Like, you don't want to attack your partners. Even when you're triggered, your instinct may be to, like, verbally, emotionally attack the people that you're with. This is an mm -hmm. opportunity step back and literally step back into yourself well I've never thought of weighing your soul before yeah it's so smart <laughs> who do I um, want to be <laughs> yeah who, who do I want to be and on the people pleasing vein what do you think people pleasing does to the soul it smothers it it's like having somebody sit over your face with a pillow and slowly putting more and more and more and more pressure on um over your face but you're the person holding the pillow and you're the person you were literally face down in your own bed putting the pressure on yourself I know oh, that's, that's a terrible huge. visual yeah <laughs> but on the but it's an important visual because yeah. you do essentially do it to yourself and it's easy with people pleasing to externalize it and say mm -hmm. well this person asked me to do it or this person expects it of me or this person needs this from me and I know yeah. that I do that I use a lot of that verbiage and I don't know that I always should because I do it to me sometimes. Yeah. This is kind of the weird point that I've gotten to. And it was honestly a social media post that, that kind of brought this alive and triggered it in me. Not to mention it was also like a vein, something that was happening in my life that was coming up over and over again. There's always an opportunity to like peel back more and more on your people pleasing behaviors, right? There's always an opportunity to better yourself. And for me, I really got to that point again, where I had that, like, I wanted to victimize. I wanted to like point the finger and blame other people. And I had such a, an intense, like rage and bitterness inside me that I had to sit with it and be like, okay, well, what is, what is my anger actually serving? What is this providing me with in this circumstance? And what I really found is that I just stayed I stayed in a situation for too long trying to make things work so I could feel safe because that's my my base for my people pleasing behaviors. But the whole time I wanted out, but I didn't get out. And so it took escalating the situation to the point where I could be so angry and so bitter that I could just like break my ties and toss them and and walk away. And walk away. But I still have to take accountability, but now I don't know, now that I know what this serves when it comes up, I'm not going to get all the way to my bottom where I feel useless. I feel unloved. I feel like people won't help me. Those aren't things that are an option anymore because I know for a fact that a, I have control over how deep I go in that cycle, regardless of what is done to me. Mm -hmm. and a really important place to get to it is I love that you brought up bitterness I never mm -hmm. hear people pleasing and bitterness correlated but that really struck an emotional chord for me yeah it's um it's it's our out 
is our out. We get so angry and so bitter and so resentful. And if, if we don't start changing the patterns, then that, that's where we're going to live. It's going to kind of crystallize inside of us and be the like color of salt, right? It, it's going to turn something inside of you and continually bring you back to it. And it's going to leave, you know, those tears kind of running down your face as you relive that situation. Mm-hmm. And I think figuratively too, you can be crying inside, right? And I, I wish I wouldn't have said yes. And I know that that's huge for people pleasers in the moment yeah. saying, yeah. I have to think about it, or I need to think about it is incredibly yeah. hard to get it out of your mouth. And oftentimes I feel that's because we're not used to saying it. It's not a normal part of our life or our vocabulary. Mm-mm. No. And it's, it's usually the other aspect for me is I come from a really big family and it's, there were so many people to take care of at all times that it wasn't a question you just everyone helped each other and things went a lot faster and a lot easier so it just you didn't you didn't consider it even as an adult my like base instinct is to just jump in and get something done Mm -hmm. yeah and not think consciously no not think whether or not I have time it's more like I try to shove everything into a box and then I kind of like fail a little bit at this task and a little bit at this task and a little bit at this task. And then by the end of the day, I'm just really stressed out and exhausted. That's the diary of a people pleaser. 95% success rate, fail 5%, but 5% at everything. Because when you are doing things that are not right for your soul, you are going to fail at the things that are right for your soul because you don't have the emotional space. Yeah. And that 5% is a literal constant amount of stress that you feel that for a lot of people can transform into autoimmune disease, emotional dysregulation, and a whole slew of other things that get trapped and held within the body when we constantly repeat these cycles, partake in them. And I mean, emotionally, physically, we get addicted to the hormones that are consistently released. So it's really hard to break that cycle. Mm, let's touch on the autoimmune because I read a study once I feel like we have talked about this before that 80 or 75 percent of women hold all autoimmune diseases and there's a big tie between women being chronic people pleasers at a higher rate than men too what's your opinion on that um that's statistics it's just straight to statistics a majority of women sorry I'm like my throat (laughs) you got to get some water (laughs) I got overly excited and started to stutter at the same time that my throat well, was we're like, excited ah. here. We're excited. <laughs> um, yeah, it's statistics. Most most autoimmune disease does happen to women. Um, but there's also been research that shows a majority of the emotional connections to these autoimmune disease is people doing or going against their own will and going against their own good to try and take care of other people who make other people in other situations a priority above themselves and their body, our bodies translates this into our actions are physically attacking us. And then your auto, your immune system then begins to attack you in various places. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's not spoken about, is it? I mean, I've only read that once or twice. We have, there's a few, there's a few platforms and a few people that, that, bring it up but I feel like somatics in that area of things is really just kind of like catching up mm-hmm. it's, it'll become a stronger and stronger like trend over the next like 10 years hopefully. but it, it takes it takes time and 10 it, years of people placing can really wear you down yeah absolutely absolutely there's one thing that I kind of want to point out too with this vein because these things for some reason they always tend to come up together we have the, the, the feminine trait that causes consistent stress is, is over prioritizing the care of other people. Men also struggle with the same thing, but in, in the externalized, right? Women internalize the care for others and men end up having a lot of their stress and what they experience in the same place from them going so far out of their way to pay for house care provide and then they end up in the same kind of situation i think that they have they run more on testosterone and cortisol or or things that their bodies function and handle better where in women we don't begin to run on cortisol and our testosterone doesn't go up until menopause so we don't 
we can't function fully that way, which is why I think we see more instances of women with autoimmune disease. But the masculine mm -hmm. struggle is, is technically along the same vein. Wow. How do you think people pleasing presents differently in masculine and feminine? Just, and I know that these are a bit of generalizations. Each person could be different. They're pretty much the same. They're pretty much the same. I mean, women do internalize while men externalize. Um, and what I, what I mean by that is like, we will as women, um, how do I say this? We will take it upon ourselves. Like, I don't know how to say this. We have more, oh God, there's a term for it. It's like, uh, invisible chores like mm, the, the yes household the labor the dishes. yeah right meal planning grocery shopping all of the little tiny things are kind of invisible activities where men's physical activities are are a lot larger and easier to seem to Does quantify right yeah, it's, yeah. it's harder to yeah. quantify the work done versus right. work that's right in your face we're running in here 24 7 and men like they run it some of them do are very very men mental right they spend a lot of time in their head but they're also very good at putting in the physical action very quickly where women we're going to keep running it mm, so it's hard to shut that programming off yeah our emotions are going to just run and run and run and run and build where guys mm. like they start to build and then they explode they physically do and mm. And I can see how people pleasing would play into that. Yeah. Because women will tend to do it longer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. When you are starting to, I suppose, unravel is a good word. Unravel mm -hmm. your people pleasing tendencies. What's one of the first things you tried that was effective? I'm always interested in this. Um, my brain went straight to... So I had a period of my life where I had started to become agoraphobic, which means I, I wasn't fully afraid of the outside world, but I couldn't be in public and, and remain in a positive, healthy mental state. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like uh, I was too much, too much attention on me, made me very uncomfortable. Um, to the extent where like I was at a gas station a guy comes over to like tell me that I'm cute I'm terrified I'm trying like my best to finish like finish my car and just get the gas get away like run away just it was so intense for me to let people down and shut down the attention that mm -hmm. it was very very difficult it, and I don't know, for a period of time, this became really intense for me. And strangely enough, the habit that shifted that was I started having kind of <laughs> started having this playful conversation <laughs> yeah. with myself. <laughs> I, I converse with myself. You're in good company. Yeah, but at the end of the day, like I was putting on a good amount of makeup when I went out into the world or when I went to work or did these other things. So at the end of the day, I would go and take my makeup off and just like, I was so happy that I didn't feel like I had to wear this mask or put on this performance or like be kind or polite to anybody that I was, I was just happy I was going to be in my own space. And I got to spend time with me that when I took off my makeup, I started giving myself a pep talk. <laughs> That's incredible. Hey, you're back. I'm so glad you're here. That's and incredible. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was something that like kind of started as a joke. And I kind of carried on for so long that like I would pass myself in the window or the mirror and I'd see myself and I'd be like, hey, bitch. <laughs> yeah, doing? like a girl, you look adorable. I'm like literally like in my head I'm like I'm I'm crazy but I'm enjoying myself so but it I'm not gonna like stop being positive or talking positively towards myself um and it, it became one of those things that even though it started as like just a random like a random thing I did one day within 
a month of just kind of pushing myself to do it without reservation. Like even if it made me look crazy in front of other people, I would still do it. And then I would kind of pick up their reaction and kind of like giggle at them yeah. because it was absurd. And I was aware that my behavior was absurd. Um, but within a month, like I believed it. I believed it completely that I was the luckiest person in the world. I was someone that everyone loved to see. Um, all of those little things that like made it really hard for me out in the world just kind of melted because I held my own, I held my own space. My, I love that. Yeah. My physical behaviors, right. were going against my best good people being polite and kind of shutting it down it made no sense. And just being able to like love and support myself, it changed kind of the subconscious behavior. So then my body and my mind started to physically react to, to the inverse, right? So instead of subconsciously saying that people were going to hurt me, my body was like, everyone loves me because I'm awesome and I love myself. Yes. And I love that that point too, is it's not like this really clinical, because I think that makes me uncomfortable. When I, when I thought of, how do I want to reverse or rewire my people pleasing behavior? I didn't mm-hmm. want to do something like really challenging or really crazy or really bizarre. My sister's a social worker. I didn't want to do anything too, um, you know, clinical. And I love that that's a little tweak somebody can make. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't take a ton of time. It's yeah. little, and it doesn't have to be huge with people pleasing. It just has to be intentional. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with people pleasing, it always comes down to your orientation. Who are you thinking about first? It needs to be you. You've got to think about yourself first. And I've, I've had a lot of people kind of bring this up and say, well, isn't that selfish? Isn't that like not a good thing? Isn't that egotistical? And it's like, I'm not working with overly egotistical people that are attacking other people. I'm working with people who go out of their way to help other people to the extent that they're breaking down. Like I am looking forward to helping these people actually internalize and start to like really see themselves, like really see themselves and put themselves first. Like that's beautiful. Like I'm not working with an egotistical monster that's running around hurting people. I'm working with people that are ready for a change and know that they can't support other people if they don't support themselves because you can't function. You're can't working function. with sane people, rational people, normal people. None of that crazy is what yeah. you're <laughs> I can see I mean, how people get a little nervous. Like everyone's a little crazy in their own right. We're a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you were going to give two actionable tips or strategies to people that want to start unwiring the people pleasing behavior, what would those two actionable tips and strategies be? That is a good question. It's a hard question. I know. Yeah. It's so individualized. People pleasing is so individualized. Um, I did give like good tips in the video that we put out previously. Um, the most important one is to start. Okay. Here's, here's two things. This is where we'll start. Start expressing yourself with your words. Start expressing yourself. Your inside thoughts, start to let them out. Let them out. Stop talking to yourself and start speaking out loud. I want you to romanticize your life and start speaking the beauty that you have for other people about your own life. Let it out. Don't don't ruminate. Don't allow all of that stuff to, to just don't let it sit inside. Let your authenticity come forward and start speaking beautiful things upon your own life. That's the first one. The second one, the second one is from the video, love your no. Love Mm -hmm. saying no. Honor when you don't feel good. Pay attention to when you don't feel good. Don't only pay attention to when you don't feel good, right? These two, they have to go together. You have to speak blessings and beauty into your life and speak beautiful things about yourself and about your life and then honor yourself when you are not capable of doing something. If your brain goes, ooh, can I fit all of this in today? The answer is no. <laughs> uh-uh. Take one activity out and put one activity in for yourself. Like make, make time for you to actually rest and relax. Mm-hmm. Oh it's my so- goodness. 
I love yeah. the second one. I yeah, really want to go say no to a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> but in a, in a compassionate and loving way. <laughs> Not in a rude That's way. True. But it does make you want to say no, doesn't it? And it, it gets you fired up. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it when you first start to try, it's going to feel terrible. It's probably going to feel like you're being mean. But I have I have yet to see somebody try to be mean and actually succeed when they are a people pleaser yeah so. usually that that doesn't go hand to hand oh, no <laughs> no not not usually no. oh my goodness <laughs> I have had so much fun with you you are so incredible if people want to connect with you they want to get to know you potentially work with you what's the easiest way to get in touch with you um there's two places to go you can go to emotionalarchitecture.us which is my website or you can visit me on Instagram. Um, both of those places, you're going to find all of the content and articles and different things that I put out into the world so you can get to know me a little bit better. And then obviously, both of those, you can schedule a consultation to see if it's right for us to work together. Um, Instagram is a little bit tricky. It's at E underscore and then emotional architecture. <laughs> but you can find her. You can also probably type in her beautiful name. Yeah, that works. And we'll have, we'll, have the, we'll have the beautiful spelling of her name. So yeah. we'll put her, her links in there too, so that nobody gets too tricked up. They're messaging some account that's not you. Perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to meet with me. I appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. You too. And thank, thank you, so you to, oh, of course. And thank you to everyone who has joined us. <laughs> you can turn it off. Okay, I'm working on it. <laughs> You will receive an email notification. Okay, perfect.